What is up, Nets fans? Welcome to the Brooklyn Buzz, presented by OTGBasketball.com. Your host, Nick Faye, with me as always, the great Australian Jack Manuel, and another special guest, another Australian, Zach Murphy from Nets Republic. What's up, fellas? Hey, how you doing, guys? Glad to be Nick, back. Nick sounds very happy. He's seen Karis LeVert in the flesh. Um, he's, still, <laughs> he's still recovering, ladies and gentlemen. I'm still recovering. I'm still on that high right now, and obviously Karis has looked great. We're going to talk about today, Nets Pacers, Nets Knicks, a couple more topics at the end. As always, check out the show, iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OGGBasketball.com, NetsRepublic.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube. But let's, guys, let's start with the sour note, and that's Nets and Pacers. Nets just came off, just lost that game, 132-112. Was not a good performance, a lot of sloppy play. What was your initial takeaways from this one? Um, Yeah, um, usually turnovers has been a problem for the Nets and it's come to play again. Sloppy play, as you said, especially that third quarter and start of the fourth really killed us and it showed that the Pacers are an elite team in the East and showed how far away we kind of are from that, from reaching that level yet with our sloppy plays in the fourth quarter. Um, I think Karis LeVert played awesome. He, I'm pretty sure he went eight from nine, yep. which is awesome efficiency, which is what we like to see from our future star. Um, Awesome uh, tips to Rodion's Karooks. Man, I was a bit iffy on picking him. Um, if you heard our recent, or not recent, our old Brooklyn Buzz where I spoke on, I was kind of iffy on him. I didn't really know much about him. He was buried in the bench in Barcelona. But man, he is aggressive. He's attacking the rim. He's crafty. He's going after rebounds. He's hitting threes. I just hate to see him injured. I really hope that injury isn't too bad. Yeah, um, I'm hoping that the x-rays do turn up negative as well, Zach. I mean, Kurutz has just shown so much energy since that New York uh, preseason game. And, you know, right now, he's probably our best power forward um, outside of, obviously, when Damari Carroll and Ron Hollis Jefferson are healthy. But, you know, I think he adds more value than a Jared Dudley at this stage. But, yeah, disappointing, uh, disappointing night for our Nets. There were, you know, a, a few minor takeaways. You know, we shot well enough from the field and from the three. Joe Harris and Carol Savert were good. Um, D'Lo showed some good early signs, but you know, overall, this is going to be one of the Eastern Conference's best teams. And it, like Zach said, it just showed how far away we are from really competing and you know, even sort of playing just regular playoff basketball. But you know, some decent things to to look at. But hopefully, going forward, onto the next one into Cleveland. Yeah, like you guys said, I think overall it was really just a bad performance. Like, they did shoot well from three, but sloppy defense, you know, not getting back in transition, letting guys like Victor Oladipo, Tyreek Evans get ahead of steam and get to the rim. You know, Jack and I were talking about they just pretty much killed the Nets in the paint. I think they had over, like, 40 points in the paint. And like we were talking about on previous shows, just like, and it's been hurting the Nets for a while, like, 20 turnovers is just way too much. Like, especially for a team, like, the guards have played together long enough that they shouldn't be turning over the ball at that high rate, especially, like you guys are saying, an elite team in the Eastern Conference. It's not going to cut it. And then also sh shooting 63% from the free throw line, you got to take your easy ones as well. Very much so. I agree. Um, yeah. Good point that you brought up with the three-pointers. We were hitting pretty well. Joe Harris hit a bucket of them. So it's just, it's just those little offensive rebounds, little fadeaways that they were hitting. Um, sloppy defense, as you said, really kills us, especially when we actually shoot well from three, which is a nice change of pace from our last two games. Yeah, I think offensively we looked fine in today's game. Like, I was actually quite happy with it. It was just, you know, on the other end, like you mentioned, Nick, you know, we're not able to get back in transition. And for guys like Victor Oladipo and Tyreek Evans, two of the better guards in transition, you know, you've got to really get back. Um, and, I mean, you know, we do have the personnel to sort of get that. But, you know, with the injuries that we've had, it's it's a little bit troubling. But yeah, points in the paint, 58 to 40. You know, they just blew us down there. You know, Kyle Quinn getting those offensive rebounds. Uh, Miles Turner doing his thing as well. You know, Ed Davis came in and provided some value uh, on a back to back. Jared Allen was a, you know, a little bit lackluster, but, you know, he's still, as uh, Jason Tatum fans would say, only 20 years old. So <laughs> we've still got plenty to, to look forward to with him. But yeah, uh, offense wasn't necessarily the key, but, you know, Indiana were just better there and just much, much better defensively. And I think. Anytime you see a team like Indiana or a talented offensive team, you got to try to take them out of the rhythm from the start. And they just started knocking down shots and they're going to start to hit tough ones as well. What do you guys think was the key stretch of kind of, you know, hurting the Nets and causing them to lose this game? Late in the second quarter where they kind of had those miscues or was it in that third quarter or early fourth when it kind of just all came apart? Um, I'd, I'd say the end of the third, start of the fourth was really where it started to go downhill. We kind of pulled it back a little bit from the second. Um, I think that injury that, Rodion's injury was kind of really the turning point. Everything started to get sloppy and downhill from there, I'd say. 
Yeah, I mean, it saps the energy out of you. And a guy like Rodion's has already proven that he is an instant sort of spark and, you know, in that sort of intangible energy that feeds the team. You know, when guys are making buckets like Karis LeVert, you know, that steal. Beyond that, you know, there weren't many highlights in the second half. It was one of, you know, it might not have been a call that got our way, as, as Nick mentioned to me in the DMs, but there were plenty of calls that didn't go our way throughout the night. But, you know, the officials weren't, you know, on our side, but it, that wasn't the thing, the reason we lost the game. It was, yeah, that sort of late second quarter where, you know, that foul by Spencer did when he was just completely unnecessary and undisciplined. And I mentioned and believe in my preview, oh no, my post-game piece for the Knicks was just, you know, disciplined basketball is good basketball. And there's just too many times, whether it's discipline on, you know, giving away fouls, which the Nets gave away way too many tonight mm. and the other night, uh, but also, you know, just taking care of the ball. You know, I could probably cancel my hand the amount of times we gave up the ball, whether it was D'Lo, Jared Allen. Uh, it's just... You know, um, not necessarily uncharacteristic, but it's more the fact that, you know, you've got to have more savvy than that and know that, you know, you can't, you can do those things in the preseason, but when the games are on the line and the games mean something, you've got to switch it on a little bit. But um, yeah, I think the engagement on both ends of the floor is something that hopefully we can get back against the Cavs. And like you're saying, Jack, some of them were careless turnovers. They're just easy ones for the Pacers to get out and going. Live ball turnovers. Like, you know, if you're driving to the paint and they call you for a, blo- a charge instead of a block, which happened a couple times, I'm not really that upset about it. But if you just literally, you know, toss the ball across the court, let's, let's set them up for easy, fast break. You know, that's going to obviously aggravate Kenny and the entire Nets team. But if you had to give uh, some highlight players at tonight, who would you stick out? Uh, it's got to be Karras for number one. Uh, as, as I said earlier, super efficient, showed some, put Victor Oladipo on skates on one or two possessions, yeah. which is awesome yeah. to see, especially in a defensive minded player like himself. Um, yeah, he's been killing it and showing that that preseason work and that rave that everyone's been talking about, it's coming to light. And then obviously another nod, as I've said to Rodion's played awesome, as I said already, spark plug, hitting shots, hustling for offensive boards, threes. Really, really going to be tough for Kenny to find him some minutes if he comes back soon. Yeah, I'll go with Joey Buckets, you know. Yeah. That's like Carlos Levert I was m- mentioning, you know, a-, a little bit when I was running the Nets Republic Twitter tonight. That Carlos Levert's shot from the perimeter looks slightly reformed. It's got a little more air on it, a little more arc on it. It's like a, a gorgeous rainbow that you see after a-, a rainy and sunny day. It's It's a lot prettier, and that's one thing that, you know, I wasn't necessarily as confident in him in terms of one area. Um, so that was great from him. Um, also Joe Harris is just making the right plays and he was just awesome from the three point line, five or six after, you know, a, a substandard night for him uh, against the Knicks. Um, but we know what Joe Harris does, even when he's not shooting the ball well, he does the intangibles well, probably, um, is exceeding his value. And, you know, uh, I mentioned him as a makeshift starter, but, you know, in the absence of crap, he's proving himself as a, a ready-made starter in this league. Yeah, Harris had a really nice game, you know, knocking down a three, like you said. And then he had that one play in the second half where he kind of did the press by himself, forced that five-second violation, which is really cool. Yeah, it's something you definitely don't see a lot. So you're always going to appreciate the hustle from Harris. But like Zach was saying, Karis LeVert was great. We saw him, you know, put some moves on Oladipo, really get in his bag with some nice tricks out there. And also saw the Pacers throw a couple double teams at him. That's going to be something to keep an eye on, how Karis kind of reacts to that. Obviously, passing has been a key to his skill set kind of evolving. So he's going to have to kind of adjust to that. And his teammates are as well. And like you guys were saying, Rodion's really impressive. <laughs> you know, at this point, getting a second round pick, him doing that, really no complaints. Now, talking disappointments, what play? out there really were you disappointed with um there's there's a few names that kind of come to mind i think alan crab was pretty subpar coming back from injury like a little understandable but there's so many looks that he had from three as nets work so hard every possession to seem to get a good look from three that as a sniper as he is he's just got to connect on some more of them i feel um jared allen had a bit of a subpar performance as well still play still got a few points but coming off big two games and back to back as you said he's only young jason tatum fans <laughs> but um yeah little little obviously a difficult assignment on miles turner but still would have liked a little bit more from him i'd say too yeah both of those guys definitely weren't their usual selves um i think d was a little bit sort of a bipolar performance from him started off really well early you know made some really nice passes you know he's one of the best bounce passes you know best pass bounce passing guard say that three times uh in the league but you know just he was his shot wasn't falling five or 16 from the field did hit some nice shots from the uh from the perimeter uh but it just wasn't his night necessarily where it was you know that 
fourth quarter, you know, he brought that fourth quarter sort of energy that he did against the Knicks, the Knicks into the first quarter, you know, and second quarter to a lesser extent. But, you know, when the Nets were wavering, you know, D'Lo was wavering as well. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how he plays going forward. But, you know, it wasn't the best night from him, but it certainly wasn't a, a horrific night by any standards. Yeah, at least he threw in some rebounds and some assists in there. But like you said, Jack, shooting-wise, definitely not on par. You like to see him get in rhythm, maybe get some easy shots. I think, like uh, Zach was mentioning, Jared Allen, not his best performance. You know, only three rebounds, four turnovers. And he just kind of looked a little bit tired, like you were saying, Jack. And I think other than that, you know, Alan Crabb, the injury I think is really affecting him. Nobody else was super terrible. I mean, Jared Dudley, he didn't put up great numbers, but we're really not expecting a ton from either. Yeah, I think Spencer Dimmy to a lesser extent as well. He was our worst in plus minus at minus 24, but that was probably during the time when, you know, the stretches of play when we would go down. And a lot of that wasn't his fault necessarily. But, you know, that dinky little foul on that didn't need to be given away. He was frustrated at times and I think, that can get to some players, you know, they're only human. So, you know, there were just times where, you know, he he gives the, he's been given the ball away a little bit too much, you know, not necessarily this game, he only had one turnover, but um, I think that Dinwiddie has played very well in the first two games. And this one was, you know, a little bit less than average uh, of what we'd expect from him because he set some very high standards for himself. Now, if you guys were coaching this game, what changes would you have made or you thought Kenny did an okay job and that's just didn't perform? Um, from a coaching standpoint, I think, I think he did pretty good. I think he's got in the right rotations and everything. I don't really know why he's kept D'Angelo in the fourth quarter when we were really down in garbage time. I think could have emptied out the bench a bit more. Um, like I was glad to see Farid and Musa and even Pinson get some minutes. Um, but I think, I think we did okay. It was just kind of a lackluster performance, especially those fouls. There were so many fouls. Um, Dinwiddie had four or five. Joe Harris had a few, um, I, I don't think it's hard. To, it's hard to fault Kenny at, at that point. Yeah, it's very early in the season, so you can't really criticize or critique him too much. But, you know, on, on a back-to-back, -back, you know, with such a young squad, maybe for a guy like Jared Allen, you give Kenneth Freed some early minutes, get him uh, going early and say, okay, we, we want to see some, you know, 10 minutes of, you know, hustle from you at the five position and some defense. Um, or, you know, obviously, you know, Ed Davis played, you know, almost 20 minutes. I wouldn't mind seeing, you know, 25 minutes out of Ed Davis because when he was out there, you know, he looked to be a net positive, you know, was one of our better players, you know, only minus one despite playing nearly 20 minutes of game time. So um, I, I would have liked to see a little bit more Ed Davis out there or even Jared Allen at Ed Davis because, you know, when you are sort of down or when you're sort of, you know, on the, on the verge of being broken out by a team, you know, have a little bit of an experiment. You know, I was saying to you, Nick, and uh, before we, we started recording, the, the time for experimentation is when you're against these sort of elite teams and you know, you know, the, the, the win isn't within grasp, so you might as well throw some things out there. We saw that against the Houston Rockets when we threw the switch defense at, not the switch defense, the zone defense at them uh, last season. So I think a little bit more experimentation from Kenny, but uh, I'm not Coach Kenny, and, you know, I think he's done a, a pretty admirable job through three games so far. Yeah, and obviously we have the injuries, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But like you guys said, maybe switch it up. I thought maybe we saw some minutes from Musa early, not in just garbage time. But, you know, it looks like he might not just be ready yet. Moving on to a more positive note, unless you guys have anything else you want to get in for Nets and Pacers. Where, where do you guys think after this performance? I know Corey would be, um, he obviously didn't see the game. He was out. Corey Waldron, make sure you're giving him a follow on Twitter, guys. No, nah, I don't. He's a Pacer fan. Don't follow him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but where do you think that this pace has gone? Obviously, early days so far. Uh, Tyreek Evans looks nice. They've got a lot of pieces. Sabonis mi uh, missed, and he's been really good for them. Do you think that the, their ceiling uh, is a top three possible contention? Uh, a top three. That top three is going to be hard to crack. Those Atlantic top three uh, seem to be an elite level above the rest. I'm pretty content with locking them in at four. Uh, I think them in Milwaukee. Are they? Are they? They're my four and five picks. But if everything goes well, um, maybe some injuries to those top three teams. They've got a surprisingly deep bench, as you said. It's a bonus. Even Kylo Quinn, they've got some nice point cards off the bench. Doug McDermott, too. Uh, you never know. It could happen. Yeah, um, I think Corey Joseph had a pretty good game, too, off the bench. Yeah, he had a couple of shots. Their, their depth is what the Nets have, but they don't have it in spades. And obviously, with the injury... Yeah. <laughs> We can't utilize that depth, you know, b before the season, Nick, in preview pods and even outside of just, you know, Brooklyn podcasts, the, the people were raving about the Nets offseason and the depth that they have, but you can't use depth when you don't have the, the, the full personnel available. So for a team like the Pacers, you know, I, I, I think that 
that that's the sort of team that we can look to emulate in the future. Yeah, no, I think the Pacers could probably best case scenario get up to that three seed if there were injuries. I think I like them more at four and five. Like Milwaukee's a team that I think's really interesting, but I'll save that for the NBA outlet. Um, Knicks and Nets though, 107, 105. Nets came away with a W, battle of the Burrows. You know, Karis Levert hit the game winner. I was there, it was exciting. You know, to be honest, there was probably more Knicks fans and Nets fans, but it was nice to kind of capitalize on that opportunity and take away the W. Takeaways from that game. Man, Karis freaking Levert. Yes, My sir. Goodness. He is a future all-star. I'm calling it. I honestly think he has the best case for most improved, especially for those for these first three games. I know it's early days, but honestly, breaking his career high in a second game, hitting a game winner, um, looked awesome throughout the whole game. And although he didn't get the stops necessarily, he played tenacious defense on Tim Hardaway Jr. in that fourth quarter. And that's the thing. In this league, you need two-way players. And everyone talks about, oh, he's only good on one side of the ball or whatever for elite elite players like Harden and stuff um, in previous years. But I genuinely think Karras has a chance to be um, not only an all-star or an elite player on the Brooklyn team, but elite defender as well. I think that's a huge takeaway. Um, D'Angelo Russell played awesome in the fourth quarter and in the first quarter too. I'm pretty sure he had nine points and some beautiful assists in that fourth quarter, which was good to see that Kenny trusted him in that fourth quarter after um, a questionable pull in the first game against Detroit. Um, And another thing I really, really liked was Jarrett Allen's composure. He looks like he's been in the league for years already. Just catches the ball in the post, kind of waits it, waits out for a little jump, hits up a nice little hook. He times his rolls really well, times his blocks really well. I think those big three are awesome. Yeah, I think the finesse of Jared Allen is one thing that you touched on, Zach, that I think has become a real weapon of his, you know, spin moves, footwork. You know, obviously he has an outstanding leap and wingspan on the defensive end and, you know, is one of the elite rim protectors probably right now. Um, Obviously going forward, you know, that's probably a ceiling of his that he's looking to, you know, emulate guys like Gobert, guys like Davis and such. But yeah, uh, this was Nets Republic put out a tweet. Jared Allen, the first player, following the Knicks game since Tim Duncan in 2003-2004 to have a double-double and four blocks in each of the first two games. And uh, not bad company to have him, Dikembe Mutombo, David Robinson, and Hakeem Elijah one. So um, not to put any pressure on our boy, but um, <laughs> I, I was, I was, I've been really high on Jared Allen before, and I said that he could be our best player. Obviously, Karras has just gone leaps and bounds, and that hype is uh he's more than living up to but yeah it was just breakout games uh a plenty and just a good team performance you know good solid maturity you know i think jared dudley did some nice things late for us as well yeah. uh, to be able to provide us the composure and the leadership out there that you know probably a damari carroll did a lot last season but you know the last uh, d'angelo's comments after the game it's like you know we expected to win this game these are the games we expect to win so i, I like the mentality of the nets having that sort of winning mentality not the respectable losses you know we're going to get this this win and you know we can turn to Karras you know he said he owed uh coach Kenny one and he owed us one and it's, uh it's just awesome to see this guy grow before our eyes and uh CC at Bill Simmons um are you watching <laughs> are you watching it I, I love Corey, uh, Corey shout out to Corey again he's getting plenty of shouts here but he sort of took on what I was sort of saying and he listened to the pod um when they were talking about the Jimmy Butler trade and he's just like who's Karras Levert and so um, Bill Simmons, if you're listening, mate, you know, the OTD podcast network's growing. Uh, I know the ringer's got a pretty good one as well, but make sure you listen to this one, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and then Jack, you and I have been hiring Karis LeVert for a while. Obviously, Jared Allen, too. Both guys had great games, like you said. And it's nice to see from both of them the work they put in the offseason. You guys mentioned the footwork of Jared Allen. You know, Karis LeVert working on the balance and the strength and just that mental aspect of the game. It's like he's playing mind games a little bit with the defenders, especially the bigs, with those long strides and whatnot. And like you said, Zach, nice to see D'Lo heat up in that fourth quarter and really step up. Then when he had some bad moments in that game, but he also had some really good moments where he can just get to the rim so easily. And that's something I think the Nets really could use from him. And also Ed Davis, he just seems like a guy that every game is putting out a consistent performance. But on the negative side, takeaways from the Knicks game, even though they did win by two, obviously a ton of turnovers. What else didn't you like? Oh, uh, what else? I, I, I've got to start with the turnovers. As, <laughs> as pointed sure. out in the Pacers game by the Yes Network, I'm pretty sure Nets were, that game was fifth worst in... Um, differential that resulted in a win. I think it was 19 turnover differential. Um, Nick's only giving away, coughing the ball up three times. You, you, it's very rare to get a win turning the ball over 20 plus times in a game. And I think that was 
we got very lucky, but I I think Spencer played um, different to Elliot as he normally does. He was trying to do extra passes, cross court feeds, and very unlike him. Um, other takeaways, um, I think J- we got to talk about Enos Cancer. He was bodying Jared Allen time and time again, and I've. I noticed every time Jared Dudley or Karis Levert or someone came over to pressure him and in a double, Cantor would miss the shot. I think we need to do that more and more. If if someone's just having a night on Jared Allen because he's not a big guy yet, hopefully he can fix that up in the near future. He's only 20. Um, that I think will be much better because Cantor was just bodying us time and time again. He would catch the ball on the baseline and just back his way down for like five or six seconds and put up a little drop step and get the N1 a few times, especially late in the game, that really, really killed us. Yeah, I think Nick has advocated for that a couple of times as well in the past. And I think when it did happen, you know, he would he'll be forced to kick the ball out. Uh, he's a very, very talented, one of the most talented offensive big men in the game, but can't do anything on the other side of the floor. You know, can pass the ball okay, but you know, he knows he knows his game and he's good at it. He's an amazing rebounder and an amazing offensive presence in the low block. Um you know, I think Jared Allen probably still had the better of him overall for the night because, you know, other than getting the double-double, Enes Cantor didn't really play winning basketball, so to speak. You know, there was a lot of other sort of pieces around him that, that sort of lifted their slack as well. Um, but, yeah, I think the negatives, obviously, not just the turnovers, but over our three games, forcing turnovers. You know, with yes. the net... the. Mm. The Nets really need to get better at, you know, getting their hands out, getting those deflections out. You know, Carol Savert's probably our best guy at doing that, but Spencer Dimity, maybe he needs to be a little bit more active on that end. The perimeter guys, you know, we know Joe Harris can do it, but it seems like, you know, to only force, you know, single-digit turnovers um, in, in uh, I think, two two consecutive performances, the, I think the Pacers might have had 10 exactly, but it's it's not good enough. And I think when you want to get in fast broken transition, the Nets look really good. So, you know, you show the, obviously, Coach Kenny will be probably be showing the tape on the plane and such. It's like, look, we get in transition. We've got the guys that can make the plays there. Rodion's Kurutz did it. You know, Karol Savert is, you know, lethal in transition. D'Lo has, has, has good control in transition as well. And, you know, I think it's just about being able to make those plays defensively, you know. But at the same time, you know, it sort of relates to the fouls that we're giving away. You know, a, a lot of the times we're giving away these really dinky little fouls, getting guys into foul trouble, and it sort of stops... A lot of the, off-ball fouls. Yeah, and it stops the rhythm on both sides of the floor, I think. You know, once you take sub a guy in, you know, you got to, it's it's chemistry. You know, chemistry on the floor is everything when it comes to basketball. So uh, I think that both of those have a, a, a real correlation, but hopefully, you know, against a, a team that's probably around now, Mark and the Cleveland Cavaliers, they'll be looking to get a win as well. Um, hopefully we can see more of that and... Uh, it's still early days going into game four. And we know that the Nets have generally, at least in Kenny's tenure, started the season off a little slowly, getting things right. Injuries are plenty. So hopefully we see some of the things that we want our guys to work on, um, working on it um, when the game uh, comes upon us. Yeah, and Jack, you did a great point right there. You know, the fact is they're getting these stupid little fouls early off ball. Now they're not able to play as tight a defense and really use their body and kind of take a risk here and there. And against a team like you guys are saying, like the Knicks, it's a, I think the youngest team in the NBA, they don't have a ton of talented ball handlers. You know, Trey Burke is probably the best ball handler they have right now in the squad. You know, you're just forcing them to 10 or 12 turnovers minimum. You know, like it's just they just don't have the talent out there. And I think that says a lot about the Nets and just not being aggressive enough defensively, which we've talked about this year, last year. And like you guys were saying, I think some doubles to Ennis Cantor would have made sense, especially, like I said, supporting cast in New York is not great. But uh, highlight player of the game, I think this is going to be an easy one, but who you guys got? Do I really ever have to say it? <laughs> Do I have to say it? Like, I don't know. I, I just... I, I'm repeating myself so often. He's just he's just shown so much potential and all this off season grind is just it's it's coming to life. And I was a little bit skeptical because usually people say, Oh, it's just preseason hype and people are just wrapping it up. But then every single person on that Nets team is saying Karis Levert, Karis Levert, Karis Levert, and here it is in the flesh. Yeah, I mean he's Obviously, putting his name out there for things like sponsorships and such. I'm sure you know. Get, get your pot lay out there for him. Get get him a shoe. Get him. We'll sponsor everything. you. We'll sponsor yeah. you, Karis. I uh, mean, we'll sponsor you. We'll pay to have you on the podcast if you want to appear, Karis. Um, I don't know how Nick will handle it. He'll probably be just like gaw- gawking the entire time. But yeah, it's 
I've, I've said in, in plenty of stories that I've written about Karras, it's just a, a real treat to watch this guy develop in front of our eyes. You know, Zach mentioned his most improved player contention. Right now, he'd be leading that award and is probably a runaway winner at this stage. But, you know, the award isn't given up for three games. It's given up for 82 games. So uh, I've, I've put forth before that, you know, he needs to continue to back it up. It's been three performances so far. All have been great. And he's starting to get the attention, not just from us Nets guys, but the, the wider NBA community. And that's something, you know, that's going to put, you know, we sort of spoken about when it comes to free agents, when it comes to respect for the franchise, whether it be officials or just, you know, media or, or, or other you have to have, you know, these star guys, these guys that can put out the highlights, you know, Jared Allen's doing it on the defensive end, Karis Levert's doing it on the offensive and defensive end. So um, it's really exciting to see, you know, these young guys grow before our eyes. And I think that the Nets are in a good spot going forward because we continue to draft well. It's just going to be about how we can sort of, you know, uh, get the cohesion between all the different pieces there. Yeah, and I think sometimes some of its injuries, you know, we don't even know what lineups they really practice with, you know, during training camp and whatnot. They could be throwing out completely different things. And now they're trying to adjust on the run. And like you guys are saying, Karis Levert was amazing. You know, I've been high on him for a while now. And like Jack and I have talked about on the buzz previously, the fact that he didn't get to play a lot of basketball in college and now he's getting more time in the NBA, I think is just allowing him to grow from a mental aspect as well, increasing his basketball IQ. He just looks very confident in what he did over the summer. And yeah, I like the fact that, like Jack mentioned, he's playing offense, he's playing defense and he's really becoming a leader of this Brooklyn team. And over the last two years, you really didn't hear a ton from Karras while he was on the court. He didn't really do a ton. After he hit that big shot against the Knicks, you saw the flex. You saw him chirping with Tim Hardaway Jr. That's the stuff you like to see from your leader. Yeah, Very obviously. Much. Yeah, obviously he's chirping away against uh, a former Detroit guy, former Michigan guy. So it's good to have that little notch on a, a former college bud. But um, it's just awesome to see, you know, he's still – you know, very young, you know, in terms of his NBA experience, like you mentioned, Nick, but um, it's going to be a treat to watch him for the next 79 games or so. And I've heard this on a, a Nets Twitter, NBA Twitter a little bit. I think genetically he could probably put on a little bit more muscle too and get a little bit tougher in there. So something to keep an eye on. But any other highlight players from the Knicks game? Um, um, I can't really think of any myself. What about you, Zach? Um, not necessarily highlight worthy, but I think Jared Dudley and his IQ that he brings to the game is vastly underrated amongst Nets fans. Now, everyone's going to hate on me for this because he put up, what, one point in 30-plus minutes the other game. But his, he made some beautiful screens and beautiful passes in both these last two games. And having that extra, having that veteran on the floor, Kenny loves to have that, as shown with him on the floor starting now over possibly uh, Kenneth Freed or another guard. You had Damari Carroll last year, and you even had... Um, years prior, you had Randy Foy starting. He, Kenny loves having that veteran on the floor to s settle things down and make the right passes. And Jared Dudley is doing that to a team. Yeah, yeah he, led, he led the team in plus minus as well in the, in the next game. So if you're looking for something to back it up, there's your evidence right there. Yeah, and I think he's like a low-key guy in certain matchups. It'll work out better, like we we're saying. He just athletically, he can't match up against certain guys. In a bench role where he's only playing 10 to 12 minutes, I think it'll be fine. And like you're saying, Zach, I think what Kenny really likes is that Jared Dudley understands his system. And he understands where he needs to be, where he needs to set a pick, make life easier for Karis Lever and D'Angelo Russell. He's a really a calming factor out there. And like we were saying before, I think Jared Allen had a solid game against the Knicks. Obviously, Ennis Cantor in the post by him a little bit. But offensively, we saw that patience. We saw that footwork. We saw some nice blocks as well, including one on Kevin Knox. But uh, negative players from the Knicks game. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie with his turnovers were, were costing us a fair bit in that Knicks game. It was very un characteristic of him as I've said already um everyone else kind of seemed to play pretty good but if you can count Joe Harris with his shooting except the the clutch one towards the end but yeah everyone else seemed to play pretty solid I think yeah, there weren't many, you know, real negative performances. I think it was more of a, a team collective thing at, at certain stretches, being able to sort of, you know, when you've got a lead, you extend that lead against a team like the Knicks, not let them back in um, with like clutch shots from guys like Knox. And, you know, they've got a nice little young nucleus there. But, you know, when it comes to talent, like Dilo mentioned, we, we should be beating these guys by 10 plus points. So, you know, you don't want to have Carol Silver having to make that clutch play. But yeah, I think, you know, uh, Dinwiddie with the four turnovers was Harris still shot four of six from the field and was a you know eleven points and four rebounds and an assist. So he wasn't horrible by any means, and he did only play twenty three minutes. So I think if, as a collective, the Nets played well. It was just more you know the making the right plays as a whole. You know knowing when to switch, knowing when to do all those little things. You know in the low block against Cantor and stuff. So I don't think you can put it down to necessarily one individual. 
Yeah, it was just sloppy turnovers from a lot of guys at different points. I think maybe just Alan Crabb obviously didn't shoot well, but it was his first game back, so we can't really get after him much about that. Any other thoughts on the Knicks and Nets game? Uh, I think we've covered a fair bit of everything. Again, I'm so high on Rodion's. I was I was pretty against him. Uh, well, not really against him. I just didn't really have much evidence to see what he really brought to the table because he was benched in Barcelona. But he's he's being aggressive, going against the grain, little floaters, little spin moves. I, I think we got a real steal at him at number 40, especially considering last year he was projected mid-round, even lottery. Yeah, I think Rodion's is going to be a, a real special kid. And I think um, playing in New York and Brooklyn, I think he's, he's spoken before that, you know, he wanted to make an impact. He was most looking forward to playing against the Knicks because uh, he wants to block Paul Zingas. Not yet, mate. Not yet. Obviously, Paul Zingas has got to get back. But um, I, I'm looking forward to the time where that does happen, where, you know, Paul Zingas is healthy and this Knicks-Nets rivalry, you know, hopefully we're both competing for playoffs sooner rather than later because, you know, the, the NBA landscape is much better when, you know, the teams in New York are, are, are fit and thriving. But hopefully that's sooner rather than later because I, I, I still give some respect to the Knicks. Knicks fans, not so much, but the Knicks as a whole in their organization, <laughs> um, they're doing some their nice history, things. history, yeah. Yeah. So, no, you guys are right. Moving on from there, though, let's talk injuries. So we'll go through the guys that are missing. You know, obviously, Rondé Hollis-Jefferson, Damari Carroll, Shabazz Napier, Alan Williams, Trevion Graham. Now, Rondé, it's personal right now because he just had a child, so congratulations to him. And then Alan Crabb coming back. Which of these injuries do you think has impacted the Nets the most? Um, I've got to say Rondé. I think I think we have only won one game of about 11 or 12 or 13 games where he didn't play. I think he... Um, is kind of a Swiss Army knife of this Nets team. He's versatile. He can switch on defense. He's got herky-jerky movements, can often get us a bucket, a bit of a shot creator on the baseline unexpectedly from last year. He's hitting those fadeaways where we're screaming no, but then it goes in. So we're like, yes, we'll take those. Um, I think, um, and we're especially lacking at the power forward position right now, Add, adding Karutz to that list of injuries. I think um, I'm, re I'm just really glad he's going to be coming back to the next game against the Cavs, I believe. Oh, it's definitely Alan, Alan Williams. He's been awesome <laughs> on the bench. I, I, lo I yeah, love his celebrations have been fire. I, I, I love how much he's in on us. Like it's a, a quick little side note on him. I love the the energy that he brings, and just he seems like an awesome teammate and a guy that uh, a lot of people love. You know, when uh, that sort of um, uh, he hit Jared Allen and like pushed him over the seats in the pregame and the preseason game was was awesome. But for me, I'm going with Damari Cole because I think if you sub out Jared Dudley, give him bench minutes, and you give Damari those starting minutes then I think that the Nets would have had a much better showing against the Pacers. I think uh, with Detroit Ronda, too. Detroit as well, definitely. Um, I, I think Tamari does all a, a lot of the things that sort of Zach was saying about Ronda in terms of defense and, you know, can make a play on either end of the floor. But Tamari also has that perimeter presence. And, and I think he has that leadership about him as well. And I think he's just so – he was probably our most – important player last year you know he wasn't our best player but he's our most important player our most consistent player so you know we don't know when he's going to return from ankle surgery I'll, the nets like to keep things really close to their chest in terms of recovery times which isn't necessarily a bad thing it can be frustrating for fans and such but for me damari has such an impact and when you you know sub out a guy like dudley who you know damari still has a little bit of hop about him hopefully the this ankle surgery doesn't necessarily change things for him, but I think he has a little more juice left him to steal something from you, Nick, than, say, Jared Dudley <laughs> does right now, and he's a part of his career. Yeah, and I like the skill set Damari has. I think he's had more of an ability than Jared Dudley to kind of drive to the rim and kind of makes teams a little bit more nervous. And his three-point shot is probably a, a little bit more active, where Jared Dudley has you know a higher percentage, but he really doesn't shoot a ton of threes. Like you are saying, Zach, with Rondé being out, I think they just miss some of that energy, some of that juice. I can't wait to see them all back. And then even just a touch on Alan Crabb, I think he's come kind of hindered by the injury. I was talking to Jack about it a little bit. Hopefully he can find his rhythm sooner rather than later. We saw last season it took him a while to kind of get back. And I know Kenny's pretty upset that Trevion Graham is out because he was very high in his defense that he brought. Yeah, there was often um, stretches of, of the game where Trevion Graham was playing in clutch minutes, which was pretty unexpected considering some even viewed him as like the 15th man on the roster. Um, I'd like to touch a little bit on Shabazz Napier as well. I think he can bring a lot to this Brooklyn team. He can play off ball as well as on ball. He gives the Nets um, something unique in a shorter guard, very anti-Kenny, but um, being able to be that scalpel through the defense, slash through, um, also being able to be a spot-up shooter, only adding to our list of Harris and Crab and whatnot, which is awesome. I'm pretty sure he shot 
40% plus from catch and shoot threes last year. I think a little bit of that firepower would have um, been helpful in the games where we've been suffering from the three point percentages. Yeah, I think with Trevion Graham as well, Nick, obviously um, chatting to a little bit with, with you at the game didn't exactly see what happened. Obviously, the strain hamstring, so it's nothing, it's not a tear, it's not, a, it's, it's just the strain. So, obviously, when you're flying as well, that can certainly aggravate the injuries, it can flame it a little bit. So, um, it'll be interesting to see his status going into the Cleveland game. I'd much rather just rest him. But for me right now, you know, her four position has always been a weakness. But we have literally three guys right now that could easily play there. Trevion Graham, Rondo Hollis Jefferson, Tamari Carroll, all those guys are out. You know, most teams can barely struggle with one or two losses in one position, but we've got three of them. So, you know, we saw Joe Harris spend some time at the four, which I'm all for. Hook it to my veins because it's just, you know, <laughs> small, ball, small ball four for Joe is just uh, something awesome, but uh, it's not necessarily a long-term solution. So Trevion Graham's probably our best one-on-one -on -one defender right now, I think, as well. I think he has, you know, really great energy, really great um, defensive tangibleness in terms of the fact that, you know, he just knows how to get in guys. He knows how to body them. Really underrated strength and, you know, not, doesn't necessarily have the hide about him but you know makes up for it in, in a lot of other ways similar to sort of a pj tucker sort of mold yeah. doesn't have the frame of a pj tucker and probably can't make as many threes even though he did in charlotte but a similar sort of stopper in, in a lot of ways yeah and pj tucker kind of developed along the way he wasn't always a great three-point shooter i believe so maybe it's something trevion graham can work to add some more muscle get some little toughness some mean streak in him but guys we're gonna play a little bit of stock up stock down go All for right. it going right down the list joe harris um, can I say in the middle if be, I have to? No, be you careful, gotta be here, Zach. You got to go up or down. All right, all right. If Purely you, because you, who I'm with, I'm going to go up. I, <laughs> yeah. you, well, you were already safe, Zach. You've been really talking up my guy, Karis Levert, so I was almost guaranteeing <laughs> you on another episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think he's been good. I think he redeemed himself from uh, one or two nights where he shot one or two from seven, from three. Um, but it's it's all about those other things that he brings to the table as well. That slashing, those rebounds, even those passing. He's, he's, he's got some nice assists, and I'm glad that he's more than just a shooter as most people have viewed him as. Yeah, yeah, do I, I have think, to ask you this? <laughs> no, but obviously not. But I think if you want to talk about, for me, the main thing about Joe Harris is his floor is, you know, so high compared to a lot of our other Nets guys. You know, a lot of them will get sort of, you know, their, their bad is, is, you know, really bad. Where Joe Harris is bad, he's still doing like all the little things like Zach was mentioning. So I think a lot of our guys can learn from Joe Harris. When he's not having, you know, a lights out shooting night, you know, he can still make the right plays. He can still play a little bit of good one-on-one -on -one defense. So, you know, Joe Harris is always going to have, you know, plenty of love in my heart. Jared Dudley. Um, I have to go down reluctantly. I, I do like what he brings to the table and I had pretty high hopes for him. I did write a piece on him at Nets Republic. Check that out. Um, but I think that it's just that one point night just really just dampened a lot of things for him. But I do, as I said, really, really, really like what he brings to the court, brings on the court in terms of his passing and his IQ. And I do like that he's really taken in stride that mentor, that leadership role. I, I hear him talking about how much future and potentially sees in in Karras and in, in uh, D'Angelo Russell and how he's kind of helping them watching through clips. I do believe I saw a little quick piece on him saying that he was talking to Karras about what to do when double team. Because as you said, uh, Nick, that he might be getting some new double teams in the future based on how he's performing as of now. So Jared Dudley was kind of pointing, okay, this is an option you can pass to, a little bounce pass here, cross court pass. I think I do really like all that, but overall I had a bit of a higher had a higher hope for him coming into this team. Yeah, I think for me, I would be down on his on-court performance, but up on his off-court performance because, you know, you, you rate, you know, these vets on, on different sort of scales. And and for me, Jared Dudley's been forced to uh, play a role that's probably exceeded of what his um, worth is and what he can provide right now. You know, he's not a starter in, the, in today's NBA, but by virtue of circumstance, he has to start for our Nets. So I would probably say down on him now, but if you ask me this question when, you know, our Nets are healthy, I'm sure that that could easily be reversed because, you know, less minutes I think he can play uh, with a lot more energy and he can, you know, probably provide a few more threes and such. But, you know, right now, you know, I'd be down on his um, on-court performance, but up on his off-court performance. Yeah, I think that's fair. And like you said, Jack, he's in a role that we did not expect to see him in. Like, I remember talking minutes with you when we were doing the player previews. It wasn't very high. If anything, it was around 10 or less. So, uh, Jared Allen, though. 
up, 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 all the way up. I'm so, so happy that he has developed and he is continuing to develop. Can we just talk about the fact that he was hitting three pointers and he's taking three pointers? Like he only made five last season and he made two in the first game. Like, and he pulled up for one in a fast break in the next yeah, game. Yeah, so you know the confidence is there. And to do all that and continue to keep his defense at an all-time high, recording four blocks in multiple games, um, good composure. I, I, I'm just in love with this guy. Yeah, I think I'm as high as Jared Allen as as high as he gets up when he's trying to block a Blake Griffin dunk. Um, <laughs> he's just so awesome in so many ways um you know if you want to get down on him for for one subpar performance against indiana then i think that's a bit rash but fans can be a little bit rash sometimes when it comes to to their players and, and the love that they show but you know there's just so many different things and so much growth he's shown uh from just coming into the league to now and that he's you know uh, his ceiling is as high as he can jump um it's it's going to be insane to see him develop as it is with karis um it's just uh, a pleasure to watch him grow before our eyes yeah, and he's just so wrong. There's so much potential there. He's definitely a guy we're very high. And I think Karis, we don't have to talk about. It's all stock up from everyone here. Uh, D'Angelo. D'Angelo is a tough one. Um, we got to be honest here, go, Zach. I'm going to go slight down. I'm going to go slightly down. I I was really kind of hoping and anticipating that those numbers that we saw before he got injured last season, those 25 and 5-ish nights and... He's had a few nights where his shots looked off. He's kind of forcing extra things. Seems like he's kind of being talked into a role he's not really wanting to. Like he's passing not too much, but he's kind of looking for it a bit much where he could have been shooting. And then he's taking contested shots, which Kenny doesn't like, but he likes. But I, as I said, it's only early. But I do like his on-ball defending. I think that's an up for sure. He's been forcing steals and running the break with Karras um, in a few games poking them free. I think that's a huge plus. And I do think his pick and roll game with Jarrett Allen is improving. And I do like that style of basketball that those two seem to play, get a nice composed look at the basket, but slight down from now. I had pretty, pretty high expectations for him coming into the season. Yeah, when the expectations are so high, you have to be down on a guy like Dio. We could do an easy one-hour podcast on the three games that he's had so far. But yeah, his defensive activity has been something that I've really liked. There's a couple of times where in the pick-and-roll defense, you know, he he slips under and gives away the perimeter three. But, you know, a lot of the times that's because it's a it's a really good screen from the, from the defender, from the big man. But yeah, I think his defensive activity has been good. But there's just been, because you have such high expectations for such a a talented guard and, and a guy who has, you know, we've talked about as like an all-star potentially. You know, you have to be down on his performances so far. He's had quarters and moments. Um, and like I said, um, I, I think that he's, he needs to get back to just playing some instinctual basketball. You know, a lot of the time he's just going out there and it's like, you know, what do I, what does coach Kenny want from me? What do I do with this play? You know, in that final quarter, it looked like he was just going out there and hooping. You know, going out there, it's like he's going out, and, you know, at Rucker Park and he's just hooping. Um, I think that's what you want from your best players, just to go out there, not necessarily um, fear the wrath of what's going to happen. You know, I'm going to get benched by my coach here or, you know, I'm going to end up on like a, a negative highlights reel or something. Uh, I think it's it's hard for a guy like Dylan because he has all the pressure, all the weight on him in the world. You know, did a nice little cool video for GQ as well. He's nice got magic all this- trick. I mean, it, it was pretty sweet. Um, I'm not going to lie, but um, there's just so much potential within him and it's three games, and it's easy to overreact to, re- to overreact to him. We aren't going to do that at the buzz, but you know, going forward, we need to see more out of him because he set expectations for himself and the team much higher, so he needs to start to reach them. Yeah, I think it's fair to say we were disappointed by the start. You know, it's not ideal. Like you guys said, defensively, he showed some good things. Obviously, getting under those three-pointers, you know, on the, the picks really honestly hurts my soul because it's happened a lot. But, uh, you know, the assists and the rebounds have been okay. Just shooting numbers need to pick up. Do you guys think comfortable? you know, he's not really comfortable because he's not comfortable with his teammates, the system, the coach, or just like, you know, the pressure? Uh, I'd like to say it's a bit of a mix. I think pressure is a big thing, especially coming into this year. It's a contract year for him. Um, but also the fact that his minutes have been pulled. There, There is that expectation of Kenny for him to play well. And especially when you can you can argue that Dinwiddie is the third or fourth best player on this team. So Dinwiddie and himself and Karras all fighting for that ball handler spot, that predominant ball handler spot, puts a bit of pressure on him as a player and... Um, obviously expectations as the number two pick and everything from LA. 
Um, I think I think that plays in him a little bit. And as you said, he and as I said as well, he's overthinking, I think, a bit too much. I think he needs to just go out and just hoop and be who he is. Um, and the rest, the rest of the game will come, I think. Yeah, I think obviously it's definitely a combination of things. But as well, I don't mind the lineups where it's Karis, Spencer and D'Lo. We've seen some success with it. I'd be intrigued to sort of look deeper into the numbers and, and see what it sort of shows. Because, you know, when you have three ball handlers, guys who can all make plays in different ways, you know, D'Angelo Russell has shown his floater game is absolutely gorgeous. His three-point shot is, you know, consistent enough so to speak, but, you know, probably Spencer and Karras um, are probably better than him at that, but he's been getting to the rim a little bit more uh, tonight. That's what I would have liked to him to do a little bit more, not settle for that floater and just, you know, draw the foul a little bit, see the ball go through the basket. So, yeah, I, I think it's about sort of finding the, the chemistry and the cohesion with his teammates as well. Um, I, I think it's hard when you've got that sort of burden upon you uh, a, a lot of the time, and there's going to be plenty of guys on Twitter and everywhere and all other platforms that are going to be hard on him, but if he's doing the right things that the coaches want from him and the teammates want from him, then the contract and everything will take care of itself because uh, Karras has shown some awesome things and it's almost taking the limelight away from Delo to an extent. And hopefully that means, you know, we can see some big Delo nights and go, oh, wow, we've still got these two awesome young guards that we can build around. And to a lesser extent, Spencer Dimity, who we could probably have on a nice little midway contract, Josh Richardson style contract. Um, it's a luxury to have right now, I guess. Yeah, I think when you're in this stage, it's not as big a deal. It's kind of something you're keeping an eye on and see where he's going to go from here. But guys, going through the last few just quickly, no reasoning or anything, just up or down. Spencer Dinwiddie. Uh, this is really tough. I'm going to go up. Yeah, I'm going up as well. I'm going up. I didn't answer for the other ones, but I think Spencer was a guy that was in so much trade rumors. It kind of made you think like, oh, he shouldn't be in Brooklyn, but I think they kind of need him. Trevion Graham. Up. Up. Ed Davis. Up. Skyrocketing up. Yes, I love it, Jack. Alan Crab. Down. Down like a clown. <laughs> Rodion's groats. Up. <laughs> up as much as he loves to get up and just he, that dunk tonight, it was almost there, but uh too bad with the block, but up yeah. on uh Rodion's groats. Yeah, oh look at that pronunciation, Jack. Yes, sir, yes, and sir. Last final thoughts, guys. K Kenny Atkinson. Um, I'm going to go up on Kenny Atkinson if we're doing up oh, and down still. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, if we have to be up and down, I'm going up. Um, but yeah, on the Nets going forward, it's three out of 82 guys. Let's, you know, temper expectations in terms of all the different things around the team, in terms of playoffs and around individuals. Um, there are going to be up and downs. It's a roller coaster ride. It's a marathon, not a sprint. But um, hopefully we can, you know, get back to 500 with the win against the Cavs. And uh, we'll be doing it all here, covering it all for you at the buzz. Yeah, and get healthy, I think, is another thing. We'd like yes. to see a team at 100% for that. at least one point this season. But, Zach, big thanks for hopping on. Tell everyone where they can find you and find your work. My absolute pleasure. Um, follow me on Twitter at ZMurf underscore. I'll be helping out on Nets Republic too. And, Jack, always a pleasure talking hoops with you, my bro. And you can check out the Brooklyn Buzz, iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OGGBasketball.com, NetsRepublic.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube.